Greetings, everybody. I'm Jim Edmondson. I'm the chief curator of the district, and I'm really pleased you could come tonight. In some ways, it's a culmination of a lot of things, and then in other ways, it's the beginning of things. It's, it's a culmination in the sense that in 2004, we got the world's largest collection of historic contraceptive devices, and that did kind of reorient our mission and our endeavors here uh, towards women's reproductive health more generally. And the after we got that exhibit open in 2009, we were debating, well, what next? Where do we go next? And at that time, a midwifery mannequin became available. I had seen these in Europe, and I thought, we can't let this pass us by. Uh, we acquired that with the help of the trustees of the Cleveland Medical Library Association, and then we decided we would try it in fact, a gallery around that. Uh, it started on a small scale, curated by Brandy Scalace out front on the 18th century section. And then this summer, uh, Catherine Osborne has been working on the 19th century section. It's almost done. We will have another lecture on the 14th of no 19th of November, thank you, uh, by Jackie Wolf from OU about obstetrics and anesthesia. So I'd like you to invite, invite you to come to that as well. Uh, in, it's a beginning for us in another sense that we're kicking off a section, uh, we could call it a conversation series that Brandy has cooked up to engage audiences, not just on campus, but throughout the community on topics that we deal with in our collections and it's a way to get an outreach into the community and make sure that we're better known. And I think Brandy's gonna be doing a fantastic job in that regard. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brandy. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome and thank you so much for coming. This is our inaugural Conversations event. And the reason these are called Conversations is this is not your traditional type of lecture where it's a 45 minute lecture and then 10 minutes of Q&A, but rather the reverse. It's gonna be run a little bit more like a TED Talk in the sense that we are going to give a short 15-minute presentation followed by an equally short mini panel where we're going to be talking to uh, some discussion folks here. And then we're opening it up to you. We want it to run like a round table. We actually have some guided questions that we want you to discuss in some smaller groups. Then we're gonna bring it back to the large group and we're gonna pose those questions or make those comments or talk about our recommendations because we want to get beyond the walls of the museum. The public is important to us. And for the How Medicine Became, Becomes Modern project, which is a project, NEH funded project that we're getting off of the ground, and it's going to be a digital history project, we really do want your input. What you have to say matters to us. So welcome to the conversation. There will be others of these. The next conversation series is Bodies Wanted, uh, appropriately close to Halloween on November 4th. And you can also register for that one online. Some of you already have. So I'm very happy to start this off. I wanted to make a few other uh, comments. First of all, this lecture series is made possible by the Cleveland Medical Library Association. And the filming is made possible by the Inamori International Center for Ethics. And just on a technical note, these microphones, you'll notice that they don't sound like they're on when you talk into them, but in fact, they're feeding into the camera. So when we have our Q&A session and you're talking and discussion, I'm going to be handing you the mic. Please do make sure you talk into it so that we can all hear you. All right, so we want to get started. Come on over, Catherine. Welcome to Hard Labor. So this lovely image behind me is, uh, it's a man midwife, strange being. Um, before there were obstetrics, before there were obstetricians, when men took over the practice of midwifery from women, they called themselves man midwives. And it's true that even the public thought this was a curious hybrid. And so as you can see here, we literally have this split image, and it shows you what they thought was different between men delivering babies and women delivering babies. On the female side, you have a fire, you have herbs, you have oils, you have water. And as you can see behind the man midwife here, we have tools, instruments. Some of them are instruments of destruction. Some of them are instruments used in delivery like the forceps. So we go from having predominantly female midwives delivering babies to by the mid to late 18th century, predominantly men delivering babies. And it's a huge shift, and it was happening in a couple different places at the same time. So there's not a cause. There's causes. But technology really is a big part of how this shift occurs. Male midwives could use forceps and other instruments, and the female midwives did not. So the advancements of technology were also related to the fact that birth suddenly seemed part of medicine. It went from being something that was 
Well, that's natural, it's part of life, it's something women do, to being something that medicine felt it needed to be over. It was part of medicine, and that meant that it was part of a new understanding of medicine as being scientific. And this shift continues throughout the period well into the 19th century, which is what we're going to be talking about next. I want to start with this image because this is one of the most favorable images of midwives that you will see in the 19th century that came out of a male author. So this is from Worcester Beach in about 1850. And what's interesting about this is you see a midwife going about her duties. She's cutting the cord, she's got small scissors. And what this shows is really a favorable portrayal of midwives and assisting in natural labors. And what is natural and what is normal was really up for debate in the 19th century. So before we start, I want to specify that there are many different types of midwives, right? The galleries outside focus on 19th century midwives and 18th century midwives from Europe and the US. These midwives vary. Some are officially trained, and what that means also varies widely. And others are apprenticed. So they had gone on rounds with other midwives, they had learned from them, and they had gained experience, but not in the sort of regimented, <coughs> institutional way that others had. And that's also an interesting point to make about the man midwives in the 18th century, because many of them could not actually attend births. It was considered inappropriate to bring a horde of young men training into a woman's chamber to get, as she's giving birth, obviously. And so not all of them did get the same kind of apprentice training, though some of them were capable of doing that. It usually was very class-based, meaning young men would go to deliveries of very poor women who were often being paid in order to allow men to assist in the delivery. And one of the things that's important about that is you go from having, in some cases, and particularly in rural areas, midwives are the only people that are able to attend to labors. Um, we have some saddlebags out in the hall that belong to one of the uh, ancestors of the person this building is named after, who was going through, I think, 12 counties, and uh, mm -hmm. um, administering care to about 12 counties worth of people. So if he was the only physician in the area, attending to all those labors would have been incredibly difficult. They were midwives at that period of time who were attending those births. Compared to Cleveland in about the late 19th century, where you have midwives and many of them working alongside the beginnings of institutional hospitals and private practice physicians. So did 19th century midwives use tools? And I like this question because it depends on how you define what a tool is. So we have a chair out in the gallery, which is a 19th century um, German midwifery chair on loan from the Mutter. And this is a hardback chair. It technically comes apart. It's about 60 pounds if you <laughs> want to carry it around somewhere. It doesn't recline. <laughs> it's not exactly portable. It doesn't really recline. But the woman who's delivering in this chair is sitting upright. Her feet are on the ground. And she is holding on to those two handholds. They have little fingernail marks in them if you want to go check it out afterwards. <laughs> they carry their tools in particular satchels. They carried um, small scissors to cut cords, et cetera. And there were various types of irrigators used to do vaginal cleaning during the delivery. So there was this um, annual meeting in 1857 where physicians came together to talk about the state of medicine. And one of the uh, conference papers was on midwifery in Ohio. And there was a quote from this Holston who was giving this presentation that midwives don't use tools in Ohio. But then he goes on to talk about the fact that they used ergot, which stimulates uterine contractions. They used various analgesics and calomel and castor oil. And all of these were seen as means to kind of give the woman strength. They were supporting her during their labor. And this is very different than the uh, male midwife's kind of role of intervening and correcting nature. So what is labor? So we've talked about hard labor, but whose labor is it? And so one of the things that I want to specify is this is not a physician's versus midwife's argument. Meddlesome, meddlesome midwifery was targeted at physicians. That was a term loaded at physicians about 1840s, 1830s, saying that they were using these tools in a way that was intervening in nature that was inappropriate. Things like anesthetic, so that's chloroform being administered, these were seen as interfering in natural processes. There were discussions about religion, discussions about women supposed to feel pain in order to bond with their children. But these also had physiological impacts so one of the things that chloroform can do is it weakens uterine contractions. So the weaker your contractions, the more likely you're going to need something like forceps to assist in your delivery. Those are little ampules of ergot. Those were also carried by physicians. So these helped kind of speed contractions when things like chloroform slowed or weakened them. So the question of what is normal labor was frequently asked in the 19th century. 
And we see these books. This is Spratt from about 1855. And these books started defining and narrowing the parameters of what normal labor was. So there was the introduction of techniques that were measuring blood, urine, looking at fetal positions. And the more and more research that was done really narrowed what it meant to have a normal birth. The other question was, should labor be allowed to be natural? So one of the things that obstetricians frequently carried in their bags were these destructive instruments. So these are instruments that would have been used if there was some sort of accident and there was a stillbirth <laughs> that needed to be removed, or if there was some sort of obstructed labor and cesarean sections were considered too dangerous to do. So basically, the fetus was sacrificed in this case to spare the mother from the possible risk of injury. So there's this quote from Dali, which is fairly famous. And this quote um, basically compares women to salmon being used up in the process of reproduction. Um, it's pretty startling, but his argument goes to say that these conditions, like laceration and prolapse, if they're normal and natural, then it's the physician's job to intervene in a way that will prevent the um, natural mortality that comes out of them. So Delee and his new, um, new obstetrics, which was kind of a movement toward a very interventionist birth, it was using tools large groups of people to assist in all deliveries in a specified space, being a hospital is most ideal. These are um, treatments for eclampsia, that's a clothespin in her mouth to prevent lacerations of her tongue. And that's for postpartum hemorrhage, it's to stop the bleeding after she gave birth. So one of my things that I've been focusing on a lot here is the Cleveland midwife in 1878 to about 1920. Um, again, there's no single type of midwife. However, they were frequently reduced to one certain group at this time, there was no regulation over any medical practitioners. So that doesn't happen until 1896. So basically, if you had a sign, you could go and you could set up a practice, and nobody was really regulating who was out there and who was administering what kind of care. The voices that we hear from the midwives are incredibly limited. Most of the time, they're being told from the perspective of doctors or legislators who are finding out ways how to keep track of them, how to arrest them in many cases. And we have some limited advertisements and the return of birth forms, which I've been going through. But in general, there's not very much to go on about their daily practices. In 1878, Cleveland actually started recording births. That feels pretty late to me. Um, <laughs> until then, they didn't really know how many people were being born. So you don't know how much, you know, how many people are living in your city, how much water you need, what kind of garbage you're producing. And this was a big deal. So they started really trying to push for birth recording and going through about 5,000 return of births, um, comparing names to um, city directories and census data, I found that about 54% of labors were conducted by midwives in 1878. And this number stays above 50% until 1900. So that's what those return of births look like on the bottom. If you'll notice, it says name of medical attendant or midwife. There was no way to specify which is which, which required me going through all of their names and checking to see which one they were, because it would have been easier the other way. <laughs> And that's an advertisement from 1878. In 1882, there was a huge case of fever that spread um, related to the care of one particular midwife. Um, she was a bohemian woman, so she was of Czech descent. She, it says, uh, 19 children left motherless. Four women had died at this point. And the Cleveland Medical Journal responded. And this is, again, before there was any sort of regulation. And so their response was that most of these women were untrained. Most of them were dirty, and there was no way to see if there was any sort of malpractice or mismanagement of cases because no one was really following up on this. So in 1896, yes, it took that many years, um, <laughs> all physicians and midwives had to be registered in Ohio. So this law defined what a midwife was. So one of the things it did was that it says that midwives are not allowed to do certain things, and they were only allowed to attend certain cases. So version, or the internal manipulation of the uh, baby during uh, delivery, treatment of breach or face presentations, any instruments, or treat any other abnormal conditions. So again, the definition of what is normal becomes very important here. You could get arrested if you did any of these things and people found out about it. There was a grandfathering period, referred to in some cases as the grandmothering period, um, where Basically, any midwife for 90 days had to go to the courthouse and register. She had to turn in all of her information. If she got there in 90 days, she did not need to take an examination. So about 65 women did this in Cuyahoga County. 48 of them, 48% of them, had formal training in an Eastern European institution. And we have where those were and when they graduated, et cetera. If you didn't make the 90 days, you had to take an examination. 
And this examination tested you on things like the biomedical science behind delivery, what types of things you should do during a delivery. Also, you had to be of at least 18 years of age, you had to be of good moral character, and you had to be able to speak and write intelligently in English, which is a huge deal. Most of the midwives, again, were not from the United States originally. They were moving into the, pop, the little neighborhood pockets um, that spoke languages that they were familiar with. So the need to have them register and be able to speak in English was really a way to kind of keep track of people and to limit who was able to legally practice. So by the 20th century, we started to see a rapid decline of the midwife in Cleveland. So there was a limited available training to even pass these exams. Basically, if you hadn't trained in Europe, there was no way we were going to be able to pass this exam. There weren't the schools available to train women in the skills they need. There was an incredibly low passage rate and a very high arrest rate. There were 75 certificates through examination given for all of Ohio in 11 years. Again, most of the women that received certification very early on were very, very old. So about, by 1910, most of those women were no longer practicing. And by 1914, you have decreased Eastern European migration, any European migration at all. So basically, the amount of women who are even qualified and have received training and coming to the United States has dwindled significantly. We also have hospitals and interventionist medicine becoming the norm in Cleveland. So this is the maternity hospital, which basically is the predecessor of McDonald's over there. And this basically, this advertisement from 1902 was showing how this was a respectable way for an obstetrician to conduct a labor by going to this very quiet neighborhood. It was showing that the class was shifting of who was going to hospitals to give birth. Previously, it was usually unmarried or very poor women. And in 1908, the Cleveland Medical Journal, in an article called The Midwife Question, basically summarize that midwives should be abolished because they're relics of a more primitive civilization. And one of the things that this points to is that by already limiting the technologies they were able to have and the shift in norms towards a much more interventionist birth, midwives at this point would have had no way to keep up with the changing interventionist procedures. Basically, they weren't allowed to do these things and they were seeming like they were relics. There was also one last big case, this is the last thing I'll talk about, which in 1910 there was a survey pretty much like field work, where someone went through, she was a nurse at Lakeside, and she did all of these interviews with midwives working in Cleveland. And one of the things she was particularly interested in was the usage of silver nitrate drops. So these are eye drops that were given before antibiotics. They were to prevent blindness through the contraction of various venereal diseases that the baby might contract as it passed through the vaginal canal. And one of the things that happened was that this became a very standard practice in medicine in about 1885. However, many of the midwives, many of whom had been grandfathered in, had completed their training before that date, had not received that sort of education. And because there was no continuing education, most of them didn't have access to the information about how this was supposed to go. This article, which ran throughout most of the United States, actually, blamed about one quarter of Cleveland's buying citizens on improper care by midwives. What I want to state, though, is that there were various standards of care that were introduced throughout the late 19th century. This is um, the Schultz method of artificial respiration from about 1886. And it's not that the midwives, in general, were not familiar with this kind of treatment. This is the official Prussian midwifery handbook from 1892. We have midwives working in Cleveland that had used this textbook, gone to this institution, and graduated after this date. So there were clearly some midwives who were prepared in various emergency techniques. This book also talks about the use of these eye drops. But by reducing all midwives to the lowest common denominator, these legislators were able to start doing massive rounds of arrests. The words war and crusade against midwives were used frequently throughout newspapers. And basically, by 1920, we see that less than 30% of reported births were attended by midwives. This drops to about 1.2 by 1939. And um, just to, to wrap up a little bit, the reason that we find these kind of interesting patterns in history is that it never, it's not like it begins in the 19th century, it begins in the 18th century. It begins as soon as you start seeing birth and reproduction in a different way, as soon as you start seeing tools and instruments as not just being something that could be used in birth, but something that should be used in birth, it radically changes how we view birth in general. So natural goes from meaning something that happens in nature to meaning something that happens without tools, 
to meaning something that isn't mediated. But all birth is mediated by somebody. There's always someone surrounding you, aiding you through the process of pregnancy, birth, and what happens after birth, and taking care of children. So it's an interesting shift on a couple of different lines. One, you have the gender shift. We go from man midwi or female midwives to men midwives. But you also have this cultural shift of socioeconomic status where only poor people are delivered at hospitals to middle class people are delivered at hospitals. Hospitals being indigent asylums for the poor to being like, it's in a quiet neighborhood. It's such a nice place to deliver a baby. Um, and you also found some other, Catherine found some other materials talking about the tools that are available at the hospital. Like you no longer have to bring the 60 pound chair with you or upturn a table in the middle of the living room. Instead, you can come to where there are these lovely beds that we already have available for you. Um, probably not enough beds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's also um, racial and ethnic issues as well, because the registries that Catherine has been going through primarily are recording white birds. White births, because uh, in general, the other populations, minority populations, were either being um, delivered by midwives at home when that was the, the case earlier on. But then also, as it becomes more expensive to be delivered in hospitals, it's less and less likely that you're going to end up there if you're not of sufficient socioeconomic status. So the changes in birth, midwifery, and reproduction, and what those words even mean, really shift over time. And they're still shifting. They're still shifting today. These changes are still going on. So I'm going to invite our panelists up here. And I've got a few questions that I'm going to ask them. And then we're going to be spreading some, uh, some paper with the questions on there out in the audience so that you can ruminate on some questions and answer them before we come back to the larger group for our final uh, wrap up for today. I should also mention that the word labor is kind of interesting, hard labor. One of the things that shows up rhetorically in a lot of the 18th century works by men is they call themselves the hardworking laborer at the birth. Um, and so uh, William Smelly, who's a somewhat unfortunate name, really, um, he basically says quite frequently, by dint of uncommon labor, I delivered many women. And so it's this kind of funny way about who, who is actually laboring in this situation. All right. I'm actually going to let each participant introduce themselves so they can give you a sense of who they are. And then I'm going to ask them some questions. So I'm going to pick up the mic. Hi, I'm Leslie Kushner. I am a jack of all trades in that I teach at Case. I work out at Lorain County um, at their dentistry and health yeah, as a midwife. And I work in in vitro fertilization, so a little bit of everything. I'm Gretchen Mettler. I've been a midwife for 31 years, certified nurse midwife for 31 years. I'm the director of the Nurse Midwife Education Program at Case Western Reserve University. And um, I have a small clinical practice at University Hospital where I'm also the director of Centering Pregnancy, which is group prenatal care for women through their pregnancy. I'm Vanessa Hildebrand. I'm an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. Um, I've done research in mm. Indonesia with midwives since 1996, so almost 20 years. Um, and so that, that means, um, as I'm an anthropologist, I go for anywhere between uh, a month or two years at the longest visit, research visit. And um, most of, so most of my time has been spent working with the traditional birth attendants or skilled birth attendants, two different types, categories of midwives, um, and the reproducing women. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, the first question I have for you guys today is, what are some changes in practice or conception of birth that you've seen in your work or research, depending on uh, where it is that you practice or what it is that you study? Um, my research in, and work is uh, in a very different place than um, everyone, the, the other presentations that just occurred and, and what are two midwives over here. Um, so my research um, has tracked the introduction of the skilled birth attendant um, into areas where there have long been um, very, uh, very, uh, 
lots of long tradition with the traditional birthing attendant. And so I've watched, the expectation was that women would stop using the tra traditional birthing attendant and just start using the skilled birth attendant. Um, and of course that was wrong. Um, and then the, but the change that I've seen, and the one the really great thing um, that I've, I, I feel like it's uh, very fortunate to have watched this program from the very beginning, is that I've seen women not, not using the, the skilled birth attendant at all to now there is a lot of use of, of the skilled birthing attendant, mm -hmm. but they're still using the traditional birthing mm -hmm. attendant. So it's really, um, there's been a, uh, there's a, a hybrid practice that has exist, exist that has, has come about. Um, so that's from the women's side, but from the practitioner side, some interesting things have happened as the skilled birth attendant noticed that they haven't, the patients are not coming to them to the extent that they expected. Um, they've started adopting some of the methods, um, techniques, and tools. Um, we could call it a discussion of, of diff what is called a tool or not, but really the tools of the traditional birthing attendant. And we see the traditional birthing attendant doing the same and adopting some of the practices and the tools of the skilled birth attendant. So it's been re really interesting to see. Mm -hmm. And so they're developing a hybrid practice mm -hmm. And the patients have also come to expect a hybrid practice. Right, right, okay. And so when they go to a traditional birthing attendant or a skilled birthing attendant that doesn't use a hybrid practice, they start thinking, well, this is wrong and I don't like it. <laughs> right. So, um, so that's been very interest interesting to, to yeah. track and something that I'm increasingly looking at. Great. Yeah, and I think that that's historically true too. I mean, you rarely, very rarely see something that goes from being turned completely on to being co turned completely off. It just doesn't usually work that way. So again, the question was, what are some changes in practice or the conception of birth that you've seen in your work or research? I think I've been in practice too long. Um, I've seen a lot. So my first job when I came to Cleveland was at the uh, Home Like Birth Center for Booth Memorial Hospital. And we had a four bed birthing unit and it was birth, it was not delivery. Um, that, that hospital closed a few years after I began to work there. What I, what I watched over the next 20 years was a lot of us in nurse midwifery um, abandoned what we knew about midwifery and started adopting the medical model because it was the path of least resistance. Yeah. In the last 10 to 15 years, we have done at least a 45 degree turn to the right and have begun to re-embrace what it is that we know to be true about birth and to honor what we know to be true about birth and um, to try to persuade the medical model to see things our way. So the changes that I've seen um, are obviously many, but the most concerning one for me is the increase in cesarean section. Uh, I know that we have attempted, we meaning birth in general, to come up with a way to quantify who needs a C-section, how many D cells, what are you seeing? And really, we haven't found an answer. What we've found is a way to decrease litigation. So um, you will not be sued for a, a C-section that was unnecessary as long as you have a healthy mother and a healthy baby. So unfortunately, I think that's where birth has been going. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, horrifically in places like Brazil, where in private hospitals there's over a 90% C-section rate, don't worry, you get your tummy tuck at the same time. We've forgotten just how dangerous mm -hmm. any sort of surgical procedure is, mm -hmm. even one that we can do safely. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the fact that we can do C-section safely. Um, my daughter recently had one for twins, one of which absolutely decided to be born bottom first. Um, so these are things that are necessary. Mm -hmm. My concern is that we are not necessarily mm -hmm. using them. Mm -hmm in that way. All right. Thank you. Um, and actually, uh, C-section is a really interesting topic. It's been around for a lot longer than most people think, but the safety aspect uh, has, yeah. quite, has changed quite remarkably, <laughs> um, especially once they started 
sewing up the uterus, that was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds funny, but <laughs> until about the 1870s, there was debate about whether or not that was necessary. The idea was that the uterus would naturally contract after the incision. So using any sort of suturing was just more likely to cause infection, so it was avoided. Um, at this time, the mortality rate tended to be about 60% for mothers, though. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so uh, the next question I want to yeah, ask, and this is this is actually a question that will also be asked of the of the audience during the roundtable time, is what do you think the major concerns surrounding birth are today? And um, again, I ask Vanessa here today because anthropological um, perspectives are really important for us to get outside of our own mindset a little bit and see how other people look at birth. So I'm going to be asking you from the context that you're familiar with and asking the rest of you for the context you know, that's more local. But um, to you, Vanessa, what do you think the major concerns surrounding birth are today for, for the mothers themselves? Um, well, I'd like to expand it a little bit. Mm -hmm, I mean, sure. I'm very concerned about um, women having access to contraception, mm -hmm. and especially among um, women with, uh, who are, um, are moving somewhere often not by choice. You know, we have some dramatic cases in the news right now. Um, and, um, and also just access to care. So um, I find it pretty disturbing um, that in Indonesia, there are, should a woman choose to go to a clinic, she's, she really can. It's available and um, it's for the most part um, affordable for her. And um, so making, well, we have so many cases in the United States where that's just not possible for a lot of women. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it's, it's really interesting to go back and forth and see what kinds of things are available and used in one place and that are, could be available but are not made available. Um, and then another option is um, something that, um, that was really astounding to me in going back and forth is that the extent to which women in Indonesia don't have an, an extraordinary, amount, extraordinary, extraordinary amount of choice in um, the actual care that they're going to receive in a given moment. And um, in the United States, we do have a lot of choice, mm -hmm. um, assuming that you have insurance. Mm -hmm. But women are Big often assumption. in a position um, where they don't feel like they have choice mm -hmm. in, um, in a hospital setting. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm referencing some interviews that I did with, with um, in uh, Missouri where the, there aren't, the midwives were essentially not allowed to operate in, um, in the hospitals. And so there's really kind of one model of birth that's allowable. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah. access to care and mm -hmm. choices mm -hmm. and, um, and availability of contraception. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great, thank you. Yeah. So again, just repeating the question, um, what do you think are the major concerns surrounding birth today, and at first I said for mothers, but I think for fathers too. This is not solely uh, an issue that only affects women. Reproduction, we were all born, so uh, reproduction does affect everybody. We were born and we survived. And we survived. The people that didn't survive are not here. That's true. Um, so in a different way, the, what Vanessa just said is similar in the United States. There is um, inadequate access to care across the board, and I don't mean that women are not able to get prenatal care or to have their babies in hospitals, but their ability to access out-of-hospital birth is limited. Their mm -hmm. ability to access a variety of providers is limited. Their ability to access um, a VBAC to have trial of labor after they've had a cesarean section is limited in many, many places. And these are, these are terrible concerns um, that continue to deprive women of choices that they should be allowed to have as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. So while I agree with Gretchen, I'm going to take it back a step further and say that my biggest concern is that women don't even realize they have rights in many cases or that they should be able to look. Um, when I've talked to people, they have no clue the difference between a midwife and a physician they just took the first appointment. Mm -hmm. When you say to them, are you planning to breast or bottle feed, they say, I will try 
to breastfeed. What do you mean try? We're gonna breastfeed. Do you say I'm gonna try to bottle feed? If it doesn't work, I guess the kid's done for. <laughs> we really have taken away people, um, women's ability to trust in themselves and their own bodies. They come into labor terrified, not because they don't know what to expect, but because they think without intervention, mm. this is not doable. Mm -hmm. Okay, fascinating, interesting. I, I had another question, but and because of time, I'm gonna limit that question, and instead, I'm gonna take this time to break you into some smaller groups where you can discuss amongst yourselves, and also to write down what it is that you come up with. So I'm gonna pass these out, but the questions are also up here. This is for public discussion, and these are guiding questions, so you don't have to answer them directly. They might lead to other points that you want to bring up, but how has your personal experience with this topic um, as a mother, as a child, as a friend, etc., shaped your views? What do you think are the major concerns surrounding birth today? They may or may not be the same. What are some positive changes you would like to see in your own lifetime, things that might change surrounding birth reproduction or even contraception? And four, if you could know about anything else, because remember, this is feedback for us. We want to hear your opinion. If you could learn more about this subject, what would you want to know? So I think I'm going to basically take this in quadrants. So we're going to have a group here and here and then there and there. And I'm going to pass these out and let you discuss amongst yourselves. Fantastic. I heard wonderful things. I got to float around between groups, so I, I feel uniquely privileged to have heard everything you guys were talking about. And what we want to do now is bring it to the larger group. You had a chance to kind of process some of these ideas. I have a microphone. Catherine has a microphone. Um, let's see, hands raised. And we would like to bring the microphones out to hear some of the discussion that you have come up with. What were some of the answers to the questions, or what were other issues that came up? So who do we have as our first volunteer? Okay. All right. <laughs> it just takes a minute to get the ball rolling. Um, I have, uh, it says how your personal experience um, has shaped my views. Um, I'm a certified nurse midwife, and I have been on mission trips to uh, Liberia, West Africa. I actually got to deliver a West African baby one time while I was there. I was very excited, little Robert. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that, from that experience that has really struck me is that on a global level, you know, we are worried here about women having choices about where they can go and, and um, you know, whether or not they can have a water birth. In Africa, a significant part of Africa, people are, are worried about whether or not they're gonna survive birth. Mm -hmm. Are they gonna die of a postpartum hemorrhage? or obstructed labor? Are they gonna end up with incontinence for the rest of their life because um, you know, nobody ha they weren't at a facility where they could have a safe C-section? Or even anybody just to help them you know, rotate the baby to get the kid out of there. I mean, who knows what they needed when they didn't get it for you know, four hours of uh, baby not coming out. But the postpartum hemorrhage is the thing that really struck me because Cytotec is a very effective treatment for postpartum hemorrhage. And in the part of Africa where I was, there was no Cytotec allowed in the country. They weren't allowed to import it because it can be used for abortion. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it wasn't allowed to be used to save women's lives from postpartum hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Now that speaks to a very basic level of mm -hmm. the importance of women's health and women's lives in our world. All right, thank you, all right. So let's hear from some of the other groups. That was the answer to the first question. How has your personal experience shaped your views? Anyone else want to dive in? Talk about what your groups discussed. Hmm? Oh, yeah, you smiled. <laughs> yeah. um, my personal experience is I grew up with a midwife as a mother. So I feel like I'm fortunate. I don't have um, a fear-based kind of mm -hmm. idea of birth, but we said that. We think some women in America are very afraid of birth, and that's a big problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. You said that too. <laughs> did you? What did you guys have to say about that? Well, bring it over. Oh, bring it over. Education. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's like passing the buck, but it's passing the mic. <laughs> I think mostly what we were talking about was just that you know women have a certain media-related perceived view of birth. They see birth 
as something that you do lying down with your legs in the air. You're going to be screaming. You're going to be in pain. And everyone is going to be around you. And it's going to be an emergency. Mm. I mean, and that's so recent. But people don't don't realize that. I mean, they don't realize that, like, the, you know, the bug with the legs in the air model of birth is incredibly recent. I mean, it's just really difficult to get people mm -hmm. out of that frame of mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Anyone else want to comment on that? I did actually hear that come up in a couple different places about the fear that's related to birth. Did you want to add something to that, Kira? Oh. oh, you nodded. See, it's very dangerous. Head <laughs> movements. <laughs> Um, I just I think it's interesting seeing the different cultural perspectives and educational perspectives on birth. Um, just because in our culture in the U.S., it seems to be that birth is a very fear-based thing, and so I think that's what's driving a lot of women to the hospitals because they think that the hospital is the safer place to be. When in reality, I think a lot of people that have worked in hospitals know that hospitals are have tons of infections. It's not always the safest place to be. Often having a home birth is a safer route, but we get this perception from the media, from our friends, from our family, who have been going to the hospital to give birth for years, and so that's becoming the new normal. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other? Oh, yes, all right. Mm -hmm. um, so this, we didn't discuss this in particular in the group, but just to keep going in the same direction, I had a student midwife once a couple of years ago comment that in the hospital we take a woman's labor away from her and then we give it back to her on our terms mm. and I think the unfortunate part of this whole media thing and the fear thing and everything put together is that women come to the hospital expecting that they'll be put in the bed they will be anesthetized and then their labor will progress the way the people who work in the hospital mm -hmm. make it progress with their medications. And somehow that has become OK and comforting, as opposed to having your own labor. Mm -hmm. OK, interesting. All right. Can you have a, yes. Uh, Wait. Oh, no, you probably will, because we have to record it. <laughs> She's coming for you. As a result, what happens is you have people who are sort of like the passive, women are passive participants in their own birth, and, and then that sort of gets passed on. And, and what my biggest concern is a complete disconnect between, you know, taking ownership of it. And, and if that comes from a lack of education and, and also just a control being in the wrong hands. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. OK, um, for time's sake, we're going to move to the next question. Uh, what do you think are the major concerns surrounding birth today? In fact, we've already kind of been covering this one. But is there anything you want to add to that? At least one of them sounds like it's this idea of fear um, that's coming, that, that women are afraid or that they don't have control. Are there other fears? Women are afraid and obstetricians are afraid of being sued. I think that's a big deal. Mm. <laughs> OK. All right. Yeah. OK. So, Catherine. Um, I think a big fear is education. And like Leslie was saying, often these women don't know the questions to ask. They don't know what resources they have and trusting their own body. And like you said, taking ownership of the birth process um, is something that we need to guide ourselves towards. So just enhancing education for women, all women, um, whether they, you know, we need to increase that access to it. Okay. There and then over here. Um, in our group, one of the big concerns was inequity uh, of access to health in general and mm -hmm. contraception, um, the very disparate outcomes of our wonderful health care in the United States compared to other mm -hmm. um, rich nations. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yeah. um, I absolutely agree that there's, there's an issue with um, women being educated about some of the options and, and I think better options that they have with, with midwives in the United States. But I think that part of that education actually needs to be backed way up and, and um, we really need to examine um, sex ed in, in as a whole in the United States. I mean, it's a big problem in the United States. There are lots of places where there, there really is no good sex ed. Um, and the education about women's bodies and that they um, have choices and all that really needs to become, mm -hmm. begin there mm -hmm. and in the schools, mm -hmm. pre-high school. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
But I, I think a lot of the childbirth education in this country is fear-based, and a lot of the stuff that's online that people can read is fear-based. And I think all birth education needs to start with the truth that women's bodies know how to do the work. <laughs> Having said that, I wanted to make a point before we get on to the a major concern, is that the C-section in this country is it's abysmal. It's terrible. And uh, while we call them safe, actually the death rate for women um, dying related to cesarean sections is going up. You know, the numbers are small because the amount of women who are having babies is large and the amount of women who die is small. But if you look at the figures, it's definitely going up and it's surgically related. And mm -hmm. that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the most common operation today in the United States. Most common operation, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting, too, because I think um, one of the things about the study of history is that instead of me looking at the history and looking at today and thinking, wow, how different it is today, instead I find myself often thinking, hmm, that's pretty similar to the way it used to be. Uh, women's bodies were a great mystery. The womb was a great mystery. And you know, people feared what was going on in there. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand women's contribution to reproduction and reproductive health. And even though we have greater scientific understanding today, in the general sense, the main population doesn't always have a really clear idea of what their bodies are capable of, what they're able to withstand, and what, uh, and, and again, um, a real misconception about pain, too. Um, Jack, Jacqueline Wolf, who's coming on November 19th, that we said, and you're all welcome back for that talk, um, she's actually written a book called Deliver Me From Pain, and it's all about this, these issues and the history of that, and so she's coming here to speak, and I hope you'll come back. Um, okay, so number three, what are some positive changes you would like to see related to birth? Yeah. I've made myself a hedge here. <laughs> um, well, I guess first I'll go back to like one of my major concerns that I've seen. I work in a birthing center and also in a small community hospital. And just seeing the, the separation between like when I'm at the birthing center, all the nurses and the doctors, the way that they talk about lay midwives is very condescending. Um, and when I'm at the hospital, the, the way that they talk about the doctors and midwives at the care center is very descending, condescending. And I just have found that very frustrating and disappointing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a change that I would like to see and something that we talked about is a way for us all to learn to learn from each other and mm -hmm. not just have this very negative view of each other and think that our way is the right way and the only way. Great, excellent, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so springing back off of looking at it as better education about choice and the ability of your body, I, we also took it a step further looking at how not only with this choice then re-examining how we think about birth and seeing it as this positive empowering experience where this can be spiritual and mm -hmm. really um, a monumental experience in the life of a woman and her family mm -hmm. and looking at it also as what it used to be this monumental social occasion where w communities of women were together and empowering each mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. and looking at it as something to be treasured and something sacred okay excellent all right other positive changes that you would like to see yes um, I guess in my head I, w I was really uh, impressed with the talk about the uh, the for in the foreign countries where they were both. I can't remember the two terms you used. I'm sorry. The the traditional, traditional, and traditional skilled. And skilled. So traditional midwives and skilled midwives, yeah. and how they were having to come together, and sort of become practitioners of both. I think in terms of things I would like to see, I would like to see mm -hmm. you know midwives in this country and doctors in this country coming together and sort of learning one learning the practices of each and being able to utilize them in a given situation, you know, depend, you know, so that they're better informed and able to sort of use the best case scenario in a given situation. Mm. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. I would like to see more women learning about home birth because I think it's a great option for lots of women and they overlook it. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Greater education. I think something else, oh, yes, we can, right here. Um, going off the education, just in general, I'm still a kid, I guess, so I'm still learning. <laughs> and I 
to be honest with you, I didn't know that home birth was even a thing until like I was in like middle school or something like that. And I think that that can like change <laughs> what stuff is. Like you need to be more yeah. oh, be more educated so you can have better options. Fantastic. Be able to make choices. Right on, oh, little yep. man. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that the we really need to learn more about like better sex ed in schools because. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. I can't stress that. Like, I talked to a boy a couple weeks ago who thought girls peed out of their vagina. <laughs> <laughs> that is really important. Yes. Because so. also, I, I learn nothing about boys. Right. And yeah, I'm sure they right. learn nothing about birth. So, mm -hmm. or whatever. No, that's great. <laughs> Actually, she brought up a point that I think is something necessary, and that is. Um, New York Times article today that Jim uh, pointed out to me shows birth in different cultures, and they were talking about in the one birth, Western birth, the 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 husband was there, the father was there, and he's he's talking to her and he's you know supporting her, and that's not true in many cases. It's not true in other countries. It's not true. And the thing is, men should be involved uh, in more ways than not only just knowing about what the body does and where things go, uh, <laughs> but also about just in general um, caring about the situation and realizing that reproductive health is not just a woman's problem. It's something Catherine uh, actually researches a lot, too. So that's great. Uh, any other things we want to say before we move on to the final one? OK. Uh, a theme that came up on the two questions that we addressed is kind of language. Um, and you can be empowering with language or not. And that's something that each of us today, now, can start doing that doesn't cost any money. Um, so like, don't treat being 40 like it's an illness with your language, you know, mm -hmm. like advanced maternal age is a thing, but you know, be friendly with the words that you use when you're talking to a woman who's 39 and a half or 41 <laughs> or 35, you know, um, you know, and, and Rachel came made an excellent point about delivery versus birth. Anyone can deliver a woman, but only a mother can give birth. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's just being overly PC, but I think it's a really important thing that we can do mm -hmm. is watch our words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do, do the Amish people go to the hospital more for deliveries, or are they still delivering mostly at home? You know, I don't have a huge answer for that, but I know Tony Tizano, who practices down in Worcester, actually does have Amish patients that he sees regularly, oh, and so. This woman right here. Right? Oh, you do too. So there you go. Um, I would. I, I don't have any like statistics, official mm -hmm. statistics, but a lot of the hospitals, I'm like in more Holmes County, like the big Amish area. Okay, right. A lot of the hospitals around there have special package deals for Amish mm -hmm. for them to do self-pay, and it's more affordable. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have the birthing center as an option, and then a lot of them are doing home births with like a lay midwife. Mm -hmm. Great, well. great. So, okay, Areas excellent. by Amish community. Mm -hmm. In Lancaster County, it's more common to have a home birth in some parts of, of Canada. Okay. Uh, what she just said was that it's um, it depends on the Amish community, and for instance, in some counties, it's more prevalent uh, than others. So that's great. All right. So let's just end with um, the final question: What would you like to know more about? If you have the ability to give us input as we're working towards doing these exhibits, and we have this opportunity to use digital media so we can do a deeper dive, what would you like to know more about? If you were interested in the topic. I think I'd really like to know about alternative births, so the different kinds of births that you can have. Um, and I think uh, Leslie Kushner did a really great lecture when we were students on um, alternative births. And one that I was really interested in was orgasmic birth. Um, <laughs> Who so wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? be? <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. So just, just, just the idea that birth can be not only not painful, but incredibly pleasurable. Um, and so just. You know, delving more into those things that doing that in front of a room full of doctors. <laughs> <laughs> that changes the whole doctor-patient relationship right there. Um, any? So what else? What would you? And this is about the history too. Is there anything you'd like to know about the history or or today? What would you like to know more about? You moved your head. You know that's dangerous in here. <laughs> okay. I guess I'd really kind of like to know how. You know, there's a big backlash in this country. Like, we can all see it in the current debates about abortion. And we're all seeming to be, like, politically moving backwards. Like, how is that going to affect the midwifery movement? How is that mm -hmm. affecting our birth experience? 
what is policy and politics doing to our bodies? Mm -hmm. like, I would like to know about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's certainly a history behind that. The Comstock Acts are just around the corner if you want to check that out. Um, other things, historically or today, that you'd like to know more about? How about the media mm -hmm. and how that's affected the way we are treated as women and our bodies. Mm -hmm. For example, to posh to push and what went on after that. <laughs> OK, that's good. Um, and actually, the media is, was just as relevant. Uh, a lot of things Catherine is finding in the history of, this, uh, of the midwife movement is um, actually political cartoons against midwives, depicting them as uh, dirty and uneducated and old. Charles Dickens characters. <laughs> Charles Dickens characters, basically. Um, so yeah, that, that's true. The media affected. This is happening historically. It's also happening today. Other things you'd like to learn more about historically or today? Mm -hmm. I, I know that my quadrant talked uh, a, a fair bit about just home births, and I think there was a lot of curiosity about that in general, um, just as a concept, like, you know, trying to figure out what percentage, you know, of births are home births, and how do you track down, like, wh where are those resources? How does that work with insurance, et cetera? Mm -hmm, there was mm -hmm. a lot of curiosity there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have some curiosity in terms of uh, how, what midwifery really looks like in Ohio versus other places in the country mm -hmm. and why that is mm -hmm. and what's what's stopping us from opening that up um, mm -hmm. in general. That's great. Um, one of the key issues, I think, about history is that you it does shape the way things are practiced today. And all of these questions are then and now questions. They have then and now components. <laughs> so learning about how things happened in the past um, can open windows and doors into seeing how things happen today and in the future. Any other last things? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think a, a session on um, sex ed. I mean, how mm -hmm. historically yeah. do yeah, we excellent. see training people or educating our young about what happens and mm -hmm. how, you know, all, all the things that surround it. And given the controversy today, I think it'd be interesting. And Great. What's happening other places? What and what's happening other places? Yeah. Uh, Catherine, can oh, you? Just like general it? interest in like the history of like the women's, right, women's rights movement and like how um, men can be um, also positive. Um, Positive advocates for change for women as well, like in the future. Mm -hmm. So, like looking back historically, seeing where we are now, mm -hmm. seeing where we can go from here. Yeah, excellent. Um, and this is this is true. I mean, the, the history is there, showing uh, it was once something you could be arrested for telling people about their bodies and their ovulation cycles. Uh, and while mostly people aren't arrested for it today, we certainly have our challenges that we're still trying to overcome. And it does seem like there's a shift that's going on. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess just going back to home birth, I guess I would be interested in learning more about what are the specific barriers to like midwives in Ohio, or like are there midwives in Ohio doing home births, and how are, yeah. You should come to our home birth group on Monday, because we're talking about <laughs> okay. Connections are being made. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to hear more about how race affects your experience with pregnancy and birth, starting with Dr. Sims um, using slaves, inventing right, the speculum, right. to now. Mm -hmm. Why do black women, regardless of socioeconomic background, have poor birth outcomes? Right. Uh, she's referencing J. Marion Sims, who uh, also is something Catherine has done some research on, in the sense that he was working on, um, help me out here, uh, fistula. Fistula, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he perfected the technique by practicing on slaves, on his own slaves. So obviously, serious ethical issues involved there. Yeah. Do midwives discuss uh, contraception very much with their patients? Oh, yeah. Midwives? Yeah. <laughs> midwives say yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. I mean, this, these are all really important questions. Any last? Um, like we can maybe take two more. Two more of what you would like to learn more about. And now nobody volunteers. <laughs> Um, we've talked about um, home birth. People want to know more about home birth and various um, methods of birth. But I'd also like to hear more about like birth centers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the um, home-like birth center at Booth was a wonderful thing while it was open, and it's not there anymore. And the birth center that I'm hearing about is in Amish country. There's one in Youngstown, but we do don't have very many around. I'd like to know more about how we can, you know, what, what's the history of that? Can we change mm -hmm. that and get birth centers going at UH and uh, Cleveland Clinic? 
Okay, great. All right, you guys, thank you so much. You have been the first conversations. Thank you so much for participating. Again, we hope to see you again at our other events, at the other Conversations events. They are already filling up, particularly November 4th, and coming back to see the opening, the final opening of the Birth Gallery here with Jackie Wolf talking about her experiences and her work and research. Thanks again, and thanks again to our panel.